Um, Jonathan, okay, Jonathan Turley, is a, he is approaching, and this is breaking news, <laughs> and he is sitting down on the desk with us here in New York City. Great to see you, Professor. Thank you. Um, if I could just bring you right in. Um, so the judge is now, it's fair to say, he's altered the gag order, right? He has not lifted, because there are still some restrictions here. Um, but this will allow Donald Trump to talk about witnesses, which the DA, the Manhattan DA's office, did ask uh, the judge to keep that portion of the gag order up. He is not. Um, he is now able to talk about the witnesses the jur and the jury uh, after this hush money conviction. So where do you see this going? Well, there's still a problematic aspect to all this. He's preserving a gag order in part long after the jury has left and the verdict has been brought in. That sort of defeats the purpose of gag orders. The idea of gag orders are these navigational beacons mm -hmm. that are designed to preserve the fairness of a trial. It's not clear to, to many of us why he didn't just lift the gag order. Mm. I mean, this, this party's over. He's heading towards sentencing, but he's not protecting a fair trial. One of the things that, that President uh, Trump has wanted to talk about is the fact that you had people like Colangelo, who came from uh, the, the Biden Justice Department, to effectively lead aspects of this prosecution. And that type of cross-pollinization is precisely what has been alleged in this weaponization of the criminal justice system. And so he's gotten a bit of a half loaf here, but the question is, why is Mershon still operating this throttle control over what a presidential candidate can say or not say? The, the limitations are on individual prosecutors, court staff, and their family members. Right. And he's saying that's essentially until the sentencing on July 11th, but that still doesn't make sense to you. Well, in terms of the prosecutors, that's what, that was a big ticket item for former President Trump, is to his ability to talk about how this prosecution team came together. In terms of the family members, that obviously was an issue early on. But the real question here is, is why isn't the normal by uh, conditions appropriate here. He, he was convicted. Uh, people are protected by defamation laws. They're mm -hmm. protected by yeah. a variety of different things. Why is it necessary for this one judge in Manhattan to continue to hang this Damocles sword over his head and say, look, if I hear a thing that I'm concerned with, I'm going to pull you back in here and you could be in violation of this order. And so it still is this disconnect as to why we're even talking about a gag order at this stage. It's clear the case is still before him, okay? The sensing hasn't occurred. I get that. But to not acknowledge that this is a presidential campaign and this is one of the big issues in that presidential campaign, I think is really nonsense, that uh, the judge could have gone further than he did. I think it's good that he lifted it in part. I think that he recognizes that. I don't know why he didn't do that mm -hmm. right after the verdict came in. Jillian? Uh, Jonathan, it was almost like I summoned you by quoting you because I was <laughs> literally telling Sandra something you told me a week ago, and then she was like, Jonathan, sitting down. Uh, thank you for jumping in the hot seat so quickly. Uh, this really couldn't come at a better time, though, I don't think, for the Trump campaign, because politically speaking, as you know, his lawyers have been arguing forever that this gag order was stifling his campaign speech. Now it's being partially lifted just in time for the debate, which is 48 hours from now, essentially. There was reporting that there was even concern inside the Trump camp that that gag order was going to limit the president's, former president's ability to respond to criticism, certain criticisms from President Biden. Well, it still will limit him to some extent. And by the way, you can summon me anytime by saying, <laughs> saying my name three times in the dark, and I will haunt any house. Uh, but uh, the, it still is, is dangling out there. That's part of the problem here is that it's the uncertainty as to what will constitute a violation. What Trump wants to talk about is how the criminal system was weaponized in this case and how the, the Biden administration played a role in that. And the key linchpin for many of the critics of this case is this individual, Colangelo, one of the prosecutors. Um, to what extent can he speak about that? It's still not clear. And it's that uncertainty which creates the chilling effect but that's bad enough for free speech. It's even worse when this is one of the issues upon which millions of citizens may be casting their vote. 
They, this is clearly uh, something that has affected many independent voters who don't like the look of it. You, we can debate the other cases, but many of us view Manhattan as a raw political prosecution. And, and that is going to be part of the debate, and that's going to be part of the election. Uh, that is a big statement. So big news just coming in. Uh, we'll continue to follow all that. Jonathan, thank you. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.